Uh, I did not grow up in Arkansas, but I was born in Arkansas at an early age. My whole like extended family lives in Arkansas. And the thing about Arkansas is that in Texas, like you've got Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, like cities with major sports teams, right? And so you kind of w- will be able to have conversations with people where there's like even like some rivalry. People come from different fan groups and things like that. Kind of living close to Austin is a little bit of a bummer because we're like, so pulled by some of those things. We're like, I don't belong anywhere. We're going to get our Major League Soccer team in 2021. I'm really excited about that. But um, and, until then, we're just like, we love the Round Rock Express. Um, <laughs> so you really have that. Um, but like, here's the deal. And even then, we, we have like a bunch of major universities, right? So you've got like Texas, you've got a you've got Baylor, you've got Tech, you've got TCU, and some of these major universities. Even then, there's, there's a lot in like the sports world going on in the state of Texas, but in Arkansas, there is but one. Um, there are no pro teams, and the only university that matters is in Arkansas Razorbacks. And that's how they say it, because there are a bunch of hicks from there, and I can say that because that's like my entire family, because everybody's related there. Um, but, uh, solid burn on myself. I really love it. And so with that, when I was growing up, here's what's interesting about the University of Arkansas. Here's what's interesting about their football team. They are, uh, I'm pretty certain, the only college football team in the country that has two home stadiums. Okay, so they play in Fayetteville, where the university is most of the year, but then they play two games a year in Little Rock, which is the state capital. And so my whole family lives in Little Rock, and every other Thanksgiving, um, back then, Arkansas would play LSU. It was the battle for the golden boot. Nothing says championship like a boot. Um, That's the shape of Arkansas and Louisiana. Um, And so we would go at a very young age. My uncle would get us tickets. We would get to go sit in the student section, which is not a place for eight-year-olds, because, man, does your vocabulary expand. (laughs) And we would go to these games, and afterwards, we watched some of like, the greatest comebacks in Arkansas football history because they never just like, destroyed anybody. It was always a comeback. We were like, we didn't even know we could win games. And afterwards, we, we would go to my Nana's house. Uh, and, and Nana's, like, there was her backyard. And then there, you'd go down this hill, and there was this huge like, turf practice field because there was a high school right behind her. And so we would go, and we'd watch these games. And then afterwards, we'd go back. And every victory, you never reenact a loss because that's just sad and depressing. But the victories, right, we, we would reenact those. We'd go down the field. We'd be, like, seven years old with, like, that tiny Nerf football. And I'm just stepping back, and I'm like, hey, go and run routes. And nobody in my family is athletes. So routes is, like, in circles. I hit you in the head with the football. And we're just, I'm throwing zingers. I'm the only one of us that can kind of throw a duck-shaped spiral. Um, and I'm just zipping them. And I'm, I'm sitting back there. And as a little kid, before I know anything about, like, genetics or talent. I'm sitting there like, I'm going to play football for the University of Arkansas one day. And as good as their record was last year, I actually probably still could, so it was great. But in, there's no Arkansas. No, listen, any of y'all love Arkansas that much? No, you don't, Brayton. And, oh, Luke's like, I love all teams in Division One and sometimes Division Two. So we go. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, so we go, and, and we would throw this pass around, and here's the deal. I, was, I could like, look at my dad and be like, one day. And my dad, because he's a good dad, lied to me and was like, you're right, son. And I was in there, and I mean, we have, we have like, dreams for our futures. And we start to imagine those dreams like really young age, right? Like we're sitting in elementary school, and they're like, draw a picture of what you want to be one day. And there's a kid that's like, I want to be a dentist because I want to go to school for 37 years. And there's like the other kid that's like, I want to be this thing. And then there's the really cool kid that's like, I want to be a dinosaur. And you're like, oh, therapy is going to be expensive for you, bro. Like, you're sitting, you've got these ideas, these futures, these visions of what it will be, and you start to develop those at a really young age. And then as you get older, you start to have these dreams, and, and then they become like a little bit more attainable. And within that, you will, will begin to set goals, right? And so for me, I come from a, a track and cross-country background, and goals, like that's like one of the sports that is very easy, like very tangible goals. You go, I want to run this time. I want to experience, I want to win this amount of meets. I want to win this championship, like that kind of deal. If you live in, in any other sports world, it's like, man, we want to f- finish here in districts so we can go to here in playoffs, so we can go this many rounds deep. And you begin to develop those goals at the beginning of a season. If you're in band, you're like, man, I, I really want to end up in this chair. And so you set these goals, right? Maybe you're just really in academics. You're like, man, this is a year that I just get like all A's. My GPA rises. I move up in class rank, and I have a shot at the school that I want to go to. Like, you set goals for yourself. You have dreams. You have futures. And, and here's the truth. Here's why you and I set goals. And I know that in the very least, here's why I set goals. I set goals on the things that I feel give my life worth. 
When I have goals for myself, when I want to accomplish something, like I don't want to accomplish something for nothing. Well, like my, my wife knows this and we've had this conversation like there is nothing in my world that I really, like I do halfway. Like if I do it, I'm either like on the very end of the spectrum that I am like, like if I'm gonna love something, I am going to love it the most and go after it as much as I can. When we set goals for ourselves, it's because we believe that it has worth to bring to our lives, right? So if, we wanna, if we're, we're chasing championships, why? Because we believe inherently that championships will bring worth to our lives. Like maybe, maybe you even just have a goal, you're like, man, I'm not really in like sports world, I'm like a competitive person, I'm not really competitive in the classroom. But here's the deal, you might have a goal that says, man, I, I wanna be this amount of popular, whatever measurement that popularity is, right? And so I've gotta collect this amount of followers on social media, or this much, many people have to like what I do, or else it doesn't really matter. Like I really wanna be an influencer one day, which is a job title that literally blows my mind. And we're like, I, I, I wanna do like these things one day. And so we, we have a way to measure that. And we want that because we believe it'll bring worth to our lives, right? Why do we wanna make good grades? Because we believe that good grades will send us to a good school so we can have a good job one day, and it will bring literal financial worth to our life. Like that's what we want. And here's the deal, just like passions, right? Last week we talked about passions, really loving things. We're not just talking about loving the thing that we do, we're talking about the future that we're creating for ourselves this week and how the future that we're creating for ourselves really dictates how we live now and we're looking at, at this future that's ahead of us and we say, man, that, that's largely like a good thing. Like it's good to have goals. Like complacency is really not fun. Right, like in my house, we, we had a rule when I was growing up. You always had to do one thing outside of school. Like you would have one extracurricular, which for some of you were like, please, I wish that Jesus would give me just one thing because I have 17, right? Like you're like, I, I only have to do one? Right, but we had a rule. You're like, you at least have to do one because complacency would find no place in our home. And so I was like, man, you've got to have one thing that, that you want to do. So we begin to set goals for ourselves. We begin to go, man, this is who I want to be. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. This is where I am trying to go. You have a future in mind, right? Those of you that are approaching senior year, you're sitting there and you're going, man, I, I have a college that I want to go to, that I am chasing after, right? I've got plan A, B, C, D. Maybe you're that kid that's like, I applied to 37 universities last year. Hey, there's a lot of babies up here, man. Like, they're going to cry. You're just going to have to get over it and you'll be cool. I love a good crying baby. So if you just chill here, then we let babies do their thing. Cool? All right. I say I love a crying baby, as long as it's not mine, because then I'm sad. Uh, but within that, we, we go, man, we have these goals, we have these things we're chasing, and they're good. But here's what happens, man. Here's, here's what we're going to see as we kind of look at futures and goals. We can become so wrapped up in the vision that we're chasing that we forget the present that we're living in. And here's the deal. Me and you, we largely, we set goals, and we set visions, and we plan futures that are totally apart from God. And then we go, man, but when I get there, I'll figure out where God fits. And here's how I know this. One day, I was thinking about this, about this the other day because I'm a pastor and I'm super holy, you know. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day. When you go to a college visit, if I was to sit down with you and be like, man, what, what are you going to do at your college visit? What are you going to do? You're like, oh, man, I'm going to I'm gonna talk to the financial aid department. I'm going to go look at the school that my major is in. I'm going to go look around campus, like if you're a dude, and you're going to look around and go, can any of these women be my future wife? Right? Like That's going to be your moment. And then if you're a girl, you're going to look around and you're going to be like, I think anybody here could be my future husband. Like, I'll uh, just give them the key to my Pinterest. It'll be great. Right? And you're, you're, you're going to do all these things. Here's what you're not going to do. Here, I, I, like some, and I say this. Some of you will, but for the, for the most part, here's what you're not going to do. You are not going to extend your college visit to Sunday morning and go try out a new church Sunday morning. It is, it's largely not in our heads. I know this because I visited colleges, and I wasn't like, you know what? I think I'm gonna go to First Baptist College Station this morning. Like that, that did not happen in my world. Instead, you're gonna go visit a college, you're gonna go visit a school, and you're gonna go look at all these things, and you go, man, I can't wait to get there. And then when I get there, I will figure out where Jesus lands in it. He's a, he's a part of the future, but he's not the biggest part. This is a side note, if you're visiting colleges anytime in the next you know, year or so, you should take some time, visit the churches in your area. Um, if the rumors are true and it's really hard to follow Jesus in college, you should probably go somewhere that you know a church you're gonna get plugged into. That's just a little help, um, take it for what it's worth. But there's really those things we go, man, that's how we know, how we're measuring our future. That's how we know what our goals are. It's because the first stop is gonna be financial aid and where we're gonna get our degree um, and, and, other, and like what sorority house we wanna be in or whatever. And, and maybe by our second year in school, 
We'll think about what church we're going to attend. Think about how we're going to follow Jesus. So when we look at our goals and our visions, when we look at our futures, largely you and I, we spend a lot of time planning what that looks like totally apart from God. And it does something to our souls. It actually does something with our relationship with Jesus. See, we believe that we can compartmentalize everything that we do, but we can't. Like it affects how we walk with Jesus. And, and here's, here's my hope. Here's my hope for our, our high school service. I've been talking about this in the office a little bit. Um, I don't even know why I keep coming back to this. I'm probably not going to look at these tonight. Here, here's what I've been thinking about is, is this. I want to have the most passionate group of high schoolers in this building every week that love Jesus and I want your classmates to know that you love Jesus and that you want to follow him well. But you and I, me included, we do such a good job of compartmentalizing. Check this out. I am a professional Christian. You know how easy it is to compartmentalize my job from following Jesus? It's like crazy easy. It's so easy. You and I have become so good at that, we forget about our futures, we forget about things, and we start to have conversations over here thinking that Jesus does not have something to say to them, but he does. But he does. And so we come into this moment in scripture, in Luke chapter 12, and this guy comes to Jesus and he has this issue with his brother. And the issue is this, right? There's an inheritance that is owed to him. An inheritance is a passing down of money, usually after your parents die. And so in the midst of that, his brother is not giving him his right to the inheritance. And here's the deal. If there's anything in this world that we love, it is money, right? Like scripture talks about money just as much, if not more, than sex. Right? Like, it's got a lot to say about money because it's been driving cultures for, like, millenniums. Right? It's like currency, whatever it is, it's been driving us. And so he comes in, and we're not largely going to talk about money. We're going to talk about some different things and really what's at the core of the issue. But he goes in, and he says, hey, I've got this issue. Jesus, he, he actually comes to Jesus to tell on his brother, which is, like, perfect, because I think that that is what, like, the holier-than-thou people would do as much as possible. They go, excuse me, Mr. Jesus, I am so good, and that person over there sucks. Make them suck less. Like, that would be our moment with Jesus, right? And so he goes to Jesus, and he goes, hey, my brother's not giving me what is rightfully mine. Like, it is right for me to have this thing. It's, it's the way it should be. And this is where we walk into, in chapter 12, verse 13. Someone from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus goes, friend, they had coffee just like days ago or something. He said to him, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator over you? He then told them, watch out and be on guard against all kinds of greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus is about to tell a story, but what I want to look at and see first is this moment where Jesus says, life is not in the abundance of his possessions. He addresses the heart issue that is going on in the midst of this man's life, that money is more important to him than the relationship with his family. And listen, one day, you and your siblings and your parents will fight about money. I promise you. I promise you. If not now, one day as a grown adult, you'll fight about things. He says, hey, you love money more than you love your own family. Why? Because this is this how you measure your life. How do we measure our life or how do we know how we're measuring our lives? By the goals that we set. That's how you know, like how you measure your life. Do you measure your life in championships? Do you know if all of your goals are surrounding that thing? Do you measure your life in the abundance of friends that you have or the, at least the, the acquaintances that you have? You know that by if your goal is to know as many people as possible or just to be the social butterfly or if you get overly concerned whether someone likes you or not. The goals that you set will tell you how you measure your life. Jesus goes, life is not measured. It does not consist of the possessions that you own. And here's what is true also. Life does not consist of, it is not measured by whatever else is driving you that is apart from Jesus. It's just not true. And I know because my life has been measured so long by almost everything other than Jesus. For so much of my life it has been. In high school, it was by my sport, or it was by girls, or it was by what the other guys in the locker room thought of me. Like, any one of those, at any moment, that was the driving force of my life. That was how I measured my success. That was how I measured my worth. It was completely apart from Jesus. Jesus says, man, that, that's not how your life is measured. And so then he tells this story, a parable. He says, a rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do, since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? 
I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and goods there. Now, here's the deal. He says, I don't have anywhere to store my crops. The next line is, so I'm going to go tear down my barns. Okay, wait a minute. You do have places to store your crops. Like, you have multiple barns. Um, the problem is, you don't have more barns to store more crops. You've already, you've already got barns that are full of crops. You already have an overabundance. And you don't even go to just build a few more. You tear down and build up to overaccumulate. And then in the midst of this, he says this. I'll tear them down, then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, which is how God talks to people he's not happy with. This very night, your life is demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? And that's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. He set a goal and a future for himself that is kicking back and taking it easy and listen, talk to any adult from like the moment we turn, get out of college and start our first job, we are ready for retirement, okay? Um, we can't wait to kick back and take it easy. It's going to be great. Summer vacation, again, 39 years from now. Woo! But God speaks into his life and says, you have this future that you think that you are going to live in, but I'm demanding your life tonight. You've wasted your whole time chasing after this goal that's been completely apart from me, and so you have missed out on what my kingdom has for you. You've missed it. And who's going to get all the things that you stored up? If you go into my house right now, I was what I like to call averagely successful in high school. Um, Like I was just good enough in my sport to be good enough. But I do have a state qualifier medal in the sport that I love. and I've got some other medals from some different places. If you go into my house right now, just eight years removed from that season, you will find them. Not on a wall. Um, You're going to find them in my bedside table buried underneath, I think, like some comic books that I bought for like 10 bucks and probably like an instruction booklet that I didn't read to put something together. The pinnacle of my athletic career, which is higher than a good amount of us will ever achieve, is buried in my bedside table and is probably going to be lost in the next few moves. Like, it's just, it's just true. It's just true. All of the things that I worked for five, six, seven years of my life mean nothing. I mean, the sport was great. It did so much for me. I've got a great relationship with my old coaches. I love the sport, clearly. I still take part in it and still hate myself and run around the track with you guys once a week. Like, it is the way it is. I'm my boy Briar back here. Me and him are sweating our faces off running 200s on Monday. So it did all those things for me, man, but the things that I acquired, the things that I thought were so important at the time mean nothing now because you know what? When I went on my first date with my wife, she didn't sit across from me and go, hey, how many state championships you win? I'm curious because I don't marry losers. She did say that part. Uh, <laughs> she just didn't measure it in the same way, right? No, man, like, the future that we have in mind for ourselves, is God just a part of it? Or is he the driving force of it? Like, do we only get excited about God if the thing that God is doing is good enough to be a part of? Like, if God's putting on the circus, if it's citywide weekend, if camp is good enough, like, if it's that exciting, is that the only time we want to be a part of what God is doing? If it benefits us and benefits our souls, is that the only time we want to be a part of what God is doing? If it fits the vision and the dreams and the goals that we have, but we can fit it into there, is that when we want to be a part of what God is doing? Or, Do we realize that at this very night, at this very time, I'm not saying you're going to walk out those doors like get hit by a car in the parking lot, but at this moment, if you were a follower of Jesus, your life is demanded of you because it is not yours, it is his. Are you missing out on the kingdom of God? Not that heaven is one day, but that we live that heaven is now. That we are more concerned, not with the abundance of friendships that we have, but that the peace that exists within them. That we are not gossipers and agents of chaos in the midst of relationships, but that we are loving servants to the friend that is next to us. Are we more passionate about our friends coming to know Jesus? Are we more passionate about how many likes or followers we have in a certain setting? Are we more passionate about getting championships? Are we actually concerned that the person standing next to us on the line, sitting next to us on the bench, on the court, with us on the field or on the diamond that they might know Jesus or do we just care if they're going to help us win the next game? 
because I stood on the line with a bunch of guys every weekend that I cared way more that they got through the next race with me than I cared if they knew Jesus. And now removed from that, it's nothing. Now I still sit with some of those guys because a lot of us still live in Central Texas and they still don't know Jesus. And I realized that I missed out on a moment that I spent three to four hours a day with them, often 10 miles at a time, with it, which if you want undivided attention for someone, go on a 10-mile jog with them. Like I missed those kind of moments to talk about faith. I missed those kind of moments to experience the kingdom with my friends this very night your life is required of you. Last year, we went to Rockport for spring break. We went on a mission trip. There's a few of us. Gracie Tinsley, um, who was one of our seniors last year, graduated, went to A&M, so really proud of her. She's really reached in life. Her goals and visions, right in line with God. Um, <laughs> we were hanging out one night. Mission trips are pretty cool because we get to take the time to really hang out with one another unless we're in Colorado and we work like 13 hours a day and your youth pastor's an old man and just wants to go to bed at night. But... In, in Rockport, we had this moment where we're playing this game, and game is a generous term. Um, we have this deck of cards, and we're trying to figure out how to entertain ourselves, and so Gracie writes down for every card a question. So like for the, any one you draw on the deck, there's a question. Any two, any three, any jack, any queen, any king. And she writes them down, and within the deck, there are questions like, what's your favorite color? Yeah, really earth-shattering stuff. We're really getting intimate in that room. It's crazy. And things like, what's your middle name? Which I was like, please don't draw that card. I cannot confess such a thing. Amen. You're the worst. <laughs> um, and then, then there were cards like, what's your biggest fear? And you're like, I'm not telling that to anyone. I know, yeah, hold tight with me. We'll put it like on the screen in all caps later so you can understand exactly what Bubba said and you can make fun of me later. And then there were questions within that. They're like, hey, what's your biggest fear? And then they were like, what? If you could accomplish anything, what would it be? And I'm like, oh man, <laughs> if I could accomplish anything, world domination. <laughs> we're like, oh, the, like, the world is open to me. And so they get around, we, get, we go through and we draw a card and pass it and we talk through it and we to one and we pull the card and we pull the, um, uh, you know, if you could accomplish anything. And then we kind of made like this rule. And again, your youth pastor is super holy. And I was like, hey, you know what? I get that when a lot of Christians get in a room, sometimes we can draw cards. And we're not exactly honest. We're like overly Christian-y. And so we answer what we think is the Christian answer rather than what is the honest answer. And I want to know what the honest answer is. Right? Like that moment in small group where they're like, hey, like what's the best book you've ever read? And the kid in the corner is like, the Bible. And I read the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek, right? Like, you know, and so we're like, hey, let's get past those answers. We sit there and we go, hey, when you get to the one that's like, hey, what's the greatest thing that you could ever accomplish? Like, let's put those super christian -y ones aside. Like, we get it. You wish that you could reach your whole school for the sake of the gospel. You're so holy, dude. Like, we're like, let's put those down. Let's do something else. Like, like really share something. And I draw the card. Hey, my whole life, I really, I, like, my whole life lined up with, will I go to college to run? Do I have a girlfriend this semester? Do I have enough friends? And so I pull this card and, you know, Haley's not even pregnant yet um, at that point in time. And, you know, we're, we're just kind of married and we have some goals for our family and for um, our marriage. And so we're, we are married. We're not kind of married. Oh my gosh, dude. Y'all are freaking awful tonight. And so, yeah, we're kind of married. Um, and so we're, we're really, and we pull this card and I start thinking, like, I don't, like, I've, I'm 26, and I think I've accomplished all that I want to. Like, I'm not the youth pastor that's like, one day I want to be the senior pastor of a church of 50,000 people. No, like, I've, I've only youth pastor of a youth ministry of 100 kids the rest of my life. Like, I'm okay. Like, that's good. Like, I, I'm surprised I'm here. That's the grace of God. Thank goodness. And so I'm like, I don't, and so I stop, and I go, you know, I think, here's what I think. If one day when Haley and I have kids, if all of our kids leave our house, graduate high school, go to college, and become adults, and if as adults, they still really love Jesus and love the church, then I'm happy. Like, I'm done. Like, that, that's what I want to accomplish. Um, like, if my house is always falling apart, and, you know, 
like, we, my crack in my Kia is there from now until Jesus comes back. Like, like, if all these things are true, as long as my kid loves Jesus, and Gracie's sitting there and she goes, that's a super Christian answer. <laughs> and I go, and I'm like, I, I broke my own rule, but then I, like, in this moment, got really excited because you know what? My whole life, it would have been so easy to give an answer that was apart from God. You find me at 16, 17, and 18, I'm like, what's my biggest goal? Let's go win state. Read a shop. Like, let's go do that thing. What's my biggest goal? I want to run D1. Like, what's my biggest goal? I want to marry my girlfriend at the time. Like, what's my biggest goal? It's this thing. And for the first time in my life, I was able to look and go, even now I could answer, I, I could say that I wanted to be the pastor of this big of a church, which sounds like it's a Christian thing, but t- that's totally apart from God. That's just about success and my own following. And if for the first time in my life, I gave an answer that wasn't apart from God. My goals are about Jesus because I don't want to miss the kingdom in my own household because if I miss it in my own household, we're going to miss it in this room. We're going to miss it in our community. If you miss it in your locker room, if you miss it in your classroom, if you miss it in your friend group, your life does not consist of your possessions. It does not consist of the college you're going to go to, of the friends that you have, of the grades that you make, of the games that you win. It consists of what Jesus is calling you to and following him desperately, closely, spending time with him, knowing him. We started this service with the idea that God is a great mystery and you and I will never know enough of him to be done. You should never will. What are your goals? And as you list them in your head, are they all apart from God? And if they are, how do you not make God a part of those? How do you make God at the center, the forefront of all of those? That whatever he's doing in Marble Falls, it begins to look like his kingdom. That this city does not consist of its possessions or its goals or its desires. It consists of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for tonight. God, we thank you.